<laughs> All right, folks, this is Creator Talk Live. Every week at this time, we interview the best authors, artists, and musicians that we can get onto TikTok and from beyond. Mr. David Acuff was one of my editorial clients, especially when I got back into editing. He, I edited his book like over a year, maybe a year, almost two years ago now, almost two yeah, years ago, yeah. I think it was. It was like January, yeah, 2021 or something like that. Yeah. And... Uh, uh, we had a good time. It was a book called Battle Tides, and it hasn't come out yet. We'll talk a little bit about that. But David has a lot of interesting experiences. He was an editor on staff at Disney Studios for a time when we met. He got laid off about a year later in the whole uh, turnover there. So, uh, you know, he's a big fan of the new management. No, I'm just kidding. But anyway, he's he's gone on to do a lot of other really cool things. He's actually, he just announced he's doing a stand-up comedy set, which you can tell us about. So he does that. He is a really successful uh, with these videos on his social media. He's got a TikTok channel and an Instagram, and he's also got uh, LinkedIn that I've seen. So anyway, David's doing all these really cool and really funny videos. So uh, we're going to talk about that and more. I am Brian Thomas Schmidt, your host. I'm the author. My latest book is Shortcut, which I, you can get by the, clicking the link on my tech. Excuse me while I figure out how to do this. It always It's always funky. That's right. It's there like it Back is. to the Future, Shortcut. where Marty's Shortcut. going in click and out. The link. You know, oh, click just... the first tab on my link at the top. Click the Beacons link at the top of my profile. You can order that book. Again, it's available on hardcover, paperback, audiobook, and ebook. You also can check out my other books like Predator and X Files, my John Simon thrillers, and so on and so forth. And uh, my latest book will be out next week, and that is Joe Ledger Unbreakable, co edited by Jonathan Mayberry who will be our guest soon. We've now figured out what the problem was, so hopefully he will be back on with us. Next week, we're all in Vegas at a conference, so there will not be a show, but I will be doing one Friday, and I will try to do some lives from Vegas, maybe some impromptu interviews if I can. The main issue is that it is so crowded where we are and so noisy, it's hard to find a quiet spot where we can actually hear ourselves think. So that's why I probably won't be doing much. But I'll try, again, I'll try to do a couple live broadcasts from there. So uh, next week is a week off. This week, uh, of course, we have David right now, and then we're going to have another, uh, rem- or I think a fantasy author at the end of the week. Um, and um, what is her name? Anyway, I'll tell you all that at the end of the show. I have to look it up. <laughs> all right. So I booked her I booked her like three weeks ago. I don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot going on. There's a lot it, going on. I have a lot going on because I'm my family's immigrating right now. I'm dealing with all of that. I'm, bu- I'm redoing my house to get ready for the kids to move in and the, and the wife. And... Wow. <laughs> I'm trying. Wow. I'm trying to find time to write. I'm doing editing. I'm doing the show. I'm preparing to travel. Oh my God, man, my head is spinning. It's already anyway, November, I, and you know I have my own battle shopping. tide going on. Yeah. Well, once I'm once I'm back from Vegas on the on the 11th, I'll uh, stay home until the family comes in, like January, hopefully January, and and I'll I'll be basically moving my house around and and working on that. So hopefully I can get more of an even keel. But yeah, I've I've been pretty much going since September when I released my latest book, and it's it's crazy. Wow. <laughs> it's fun, but it's crazy. Yes. So, sure. okay, that was the longest introduction ever known to man of my way of saying welcome to the show, David. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Great to be here. Yeah, it's good to see you, buddy. Yeah, you David too. David and I haven't, I, we haven't really, I don't think we've really interacted live since we did a phone call or two about your edit. It's Correct. Been no, freaking it's long, but it seems it seems like just yesterday that happened. Every time yeah, I yeah. look at yeah. it, I think like, my God, has it really been two years? But it has been. But anyway, so... Tell us, you've got a lot of books out since then. You've been doing a lot of stuff. How many books do you have out now? Uh, five, five books total. So, five. And yep, Battle Tides I, is coming out next year. You said? Yeah, I'm trying to hit next May with with that one because that one's the one I've. That was my first book that I started twelve years ago. I started writing on it, and it just get bigger and bigger and bigger, and wanted to make sure it was like the perfect sci-fi thing. So just kept. And in the meanwhile, I turned these other like script ideas that I had into books. And so those I put out just just to kind of test the waters and see how this publishing thing worked. But yeah, the the big one that I've been working on the longest will be next May. So yeah, and I edited that one. And that is a trilogy, isn't it? Yeah, well, yes, yes. But this is book number one. Yes. No, no, no. I'm not saying the whole thing's coming out. I'm just saying people who like big military sci-fi epics. That's what it is. It's kind of a space opera military sci-fi epic, and it's called Battle Tides, and it's the first of three. So yes. he'll have all series come out. Yes. How long is it going to take you? But wait, you've been working so long on book one. When are you going to write book two and three? How long is it going to take for those to come out? Well, you know, the the, the toughest thing was, was getting the world 
in place and yeah. figuring out this world. And, and now I've got the characters in the world and all that's gelled and, and locked in. The next one will go much quicker, as you know, because it's it's like, all right, I I know who the characters are, I know who this, I know who the good guy, the bad guy, and so yeah, it, that helps a lot. So that's how it was for me when I wrote my my trilogy too. Yeah, the yeah. first book took forever, and then the second book and third book were much faster. It's true. Yeah, we're it not is. looking for George R. R. Martin here. We're fifteen years later, we come <laughs> out with book two. <laughs> Not doing that. Uh, okay, good, good, good. <laughs> no, I just wanted to set some kind of expectation because there's a lot of people who are you're doing the indie thing right now, and people who there's a lot of people who do the indie that like they're putting a book out every two or three months, which is an insane schedule I could never keep up with. But right. I'm just I'm just saying that uh, just to set a realistic expectation. So tell us about your books, man. Um, you've been wanting to be uh, a writer. What, what made you want to be a writer? You know, I I started out uh, in nine years old. I wanted to be a uh, a writer and, and really loving the the creative writing assignments in class and, and things like that. It's just when I went to college, it didn't, I didn't want to do the uh, English major because I felt like I could only be a teacher if I did that. And, and so I, I think I got diverted into the film production world for the last 20, 25 years and, and doing uh, so my writing came out through screenplays and short films and yeah. so this kind of stuff. Now, uh, did but, you, did you actually get a degree in that? In film production, yes, yeah. yes. So it was in mass communication. Mass communication, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and and then uh, went back and got my my masters in specifically in directing and editing, but that was the cinema television stuff. So where yeah. you actually get to touch sixteen millimeter film and you know kind of shoot you know on 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 film and cut it with the old splicer and the tape and yeah, God, together. I remember that. I had to do that. That was too. that was that was fun. I love that. Some people hated it, but I I just loved it. Well, I wasn't very good at it because, like, precise, like, slices and stuff are not my forte. My hand-eye coordination is not very good. So I always had somebody help me. But, yeah, I mean, it was – but it was fascinating to see how, how it worked. I mean, it was really was. Right, right. You know, how you could loop the sound around it and make it look – you know, make it keep going and all of that. You know, that was always fascinating. And, and I think that's just part of my DNA is, is that kind of puzzle building where, you know, you've got all this material – in, in production and in film world, it's all this footage and you're just trying to piece it together like a puzzle. You usually have a script, but you're trying to piece it together to make nope. something cohesive. The same with writing, you know, you're trying to piece together all these little disparate pieces and characters and trying to Well, no, I mean, I can see work. it in your, like in Battle Tides, I can definitely see, because you wrote a really complex story with a lot of things going on. And like, I did the same thing. And I, I've learned since how to write a little bit simpler stories, but not that simple overall, because I, that's how I think, man. I, I, I am the ADHD guy that's all over the place, but I'm also, I used to, I mean, one of the jobs I fell into naturally when I was coming up was uh, I was the script coordinator for this um, children's uh, theater camp, and I helped teach the kids writing, but I also assembled all these different ideas into a coherent script that fit together and made it flow like a, right. it was what they called it Hill Street Blues Theater because it had all these multiple um, storylines going on and had, making them quirk together and figuring out how to combine little pieces of them into one scene so one came out of another and all that i was really good at that and it's part of what makes me a good editor and also part part of what you know gives storytelling and i have a feeling it's what makes you a good editor because you've edited tell us some of the stuff you worked on at disney if you can a lot of the stuff was behind the scenes um thanks for their press package so i worked on a lot of shows like shadow hunters and cloak and dagger and pretty little liars and you know that kind of stuff where you know they would do like a 90 second two minute featurette talking yeah. about this this fight scene where clary Frey fights off this owl creature and then so we go in we show before the effects we show it you know you know with their practicing rehearsal get some interviews and then we kind of cut together this it, that was all like the bonus dvd stuff in the in the yeah, old yeah. Days. so but the stuff also that we would see before the movie came out on the different yeah. channels and different Correct. places yeah all of that yeah. stuff yeah, yeah. That's what uh, Maria Menounos sits up there and tells us before the uh, before the movie starts. She starts uh, going through and showing some of those little featurettes. So yeah, so yeah, it's yeah. fun. Yeah, well, it's good because you got used to working on lots of different disparate things and worked with right. a lot of cool people as a result. I'm sure. So that was right. cool. Yeah, yeah. No, that was you know one of my wildest things was even though they had like the Star Wars music was under their library for some reason Fox at that time still had you know, the very first Star Wars music, the John Williams stuff. So they had done this sizzle reel that was all Star Wars, you know, all this, all the movies that Disney had done 
but it was all tied together with the big Star Wars music. So they're like, this was great for inside the company internally. Now we want to push it outside and show it to other people. So we need to make sure we have the rights to the music. And so we want you to replace all of John Williams music with library music. <laughs> and I was like, Whoa. that is going to end horribly. However, extrememusic.com had such a robust library of, of uh, and, and Star Wars was so big, they had a lot of just similar cuts. You yeah, know, the invitation stuff where moments. people were, yeah, yeah, yep. yeah, yeah. And, and so it was completely uh, in our in our domain and, and in our, you know, you know, financially, uh, we had the copyrights for it, we could use it. And then when I turned it in, you know, the guy said, all right, now, which cut is this? Is this the before or the after? And I was like, job well done. <laughs> because wow. if, he, if he couldn't tell the difference between some of those things, then. That's that pretty, good. but it's also pretty cool. I mean, you went to, you went, you know, some of you guys out there, a lot of you guys probably don't know um, what it's like, but uh, David, David went to work every day on the Walt Disney studio a lot in, in, in Burbank, which is a hell of a deal. So mm -hmm. you're, I, I spent a lot of time on the Warner brothers lot. I've been to Fox. I've been to several of them. I don't think I've actually been inside Disney, but I've been around. And so I I've had a lot of experiences of going on lots. And it's one of my favorite things to do when I'm out there, as I've told David before, is to just go sit on the lot and go grab a chair. Like a, there's picnic tables around in different places because people, people eat and there's different stuff where people can hang out and just talk. I like to just go sit there and just pull out my, my iPad and start writing because it's so, the air is alive with creative energy. It's just so cool. And you never know who's going to walk by. I had people like celebrities walk by, you know, like movie stars and different people. What are you doing? You out here hanging by yourself? I'm like, oh, I'm writing. And they're like, oh, that's cool. You know, yeah, yeah. what are you working on? You know, and stuff like that. And it was cool because, you know, you're basically, it's like you belong there because you're doing what people do. And it's just, you know, it's an unusual place to see somebody work because there's all these different offices. But you feel like you're part of it. The tours come by and you hear all the narration and you see it, you know. Yeah. And you can walk down the back lot and you can go. You're one day, one minute you're on, on in Brooklyn. The next minute you're in old old West Town. The next minute you're in you know downtown mid Midwest USA or whatever. You know, it's a pretty cool feeling to see that. You just that, feel so magical. That Warner Brothers lot is my favorite lot because it still has that that old school feel to it and just looks yeah. just like you know from the forties. Uh, you can really just does. imagine you know Humphrey Bogart and those guys just walking down there making their making their yeah. movie. See. <laughs> So. That's why I love it. That's why I love it so much too. Is it just? I mean, when they keep every time they get rid of some of the back lot, I always am afraid eventually one day it won't be there. But right now they still have some of it, so it's really really cool. Right. You know, I mean, the old Hazard Square is still there with the gazebo. You know, from Dukes of Hazard when I was a kid, all that yep. stuff. Yeah. And that was that was now on the Disney lot. It is kind of fun because they recycle a lot of those. It, it doesn't have as many as the back lots as a Warner Brothers. Yeah, but it it did have a lot of the locations still in there where it's like, all right, this is the street that they use on the show Gronish. This was the place, the tunnel where they shot Jennifer Garner and Alias, where she's running through the tunnel, and I'm like, oh, yeah. that's. And so when I watched some of these shows like Alias, I was rewatching it after I had worked there, and I'm like, oh, that's that's Legends Plaza. That's underneath this building where I've been to yeah. that. I've been in that elevator. It was just so fun to kind of be around those areas. And, and at Fox Studios, you've got Nakatomi Plaza, the building from Ooh, Die Hard, nice. which is the the executive building. And it's right there, nice. you know? So it, it, yeah, it was, it's very cool because, uh, and the other thing is it's fun to watch it change. You'll see these streets and, and they'll be looking pretty ordinary and plain. And then one day, all of a sudden, they'll be painted up and there'll be new signs and everything will be different. There'll be bushes that showed up out of nowhere. Mm -hmm. That's because they're getting ready to shoot. And you can see, yeah. oh, you know, it, it's really amazing how they could just transform things into something, right. you know, unique. And you'd think as I start to recognize some of the Warner Brothers sets now on different shows because, oh, yeah, I know where that is. Because, mm -hmm. look, you know, if you know what it looks like and you've seen it enough, you know it. But, you know, it also is funny because... Um, Sometimes you can just, you know, they, they change it up so many times people didn't even know, you know, yeah, people yeah. Even... And, and, and controlling just what is in that frame, you know, you can pan a little bit left this way and, and the illusion's gone or you can pan this, but yeah, if you exactly. just throw in, like you said, a bush here or some banners there, and now you've got a sci-fi film or you've got, yeah. yeah. So their, their ability to change the same location and just reuse it is, is remarkable. It's cool. It's cool. It, it is cool. It is cool. I remember uh, the lot at, uh, at at CBS TV Center, which uh, which used to be MTM. 
that uh, is, I, I walked by there, and that's where they were shooting the outside stuff for Seinfeld and different yes. stuff. And, that's a great one. And, and they that's and you'd round a corner, and there was Burt Reynolds' house from when he he had that sitcom. What was it called? Where where he was the coach, you know, in the little town. Oh, and, right, right. Yeah, and then and then next the next to that was the uh, the house for the uh, designing women, you know. <laughs> yep. Yep. All uh, of that and Roseanne's, you know, and all. Yes. And then you walk in every, each of the stages. You walk in and you're in. Like I was inside uh, at Warner Brothers in one of the lot stage. It's the Batman stage, and mm -hmm. they, that's where they had they were shooting China Beach. And I walked in there and I'm in the morgue and there's all these. There weren't really corpses, but they were body bags, you know. Nice. And, it, and they left me alone in there uh, because the the lady got called over to do something and and she was my mom was with her, so I'm in there alone and I'm going. I really want to open one of these bags. This is creepy, but I want to open one of these bags. What the hell is in this bag? It looks yeah. like a real body, right? That's you know? awesome. Can I take one of these? But the <laughs> coolest part is, then later I went to the shooting location where they shot Little House on the Prairie, and they also, uh, it's a, it's out, it's way up north, and mm -hmm. and there's an a old lot there, but it's also where they shot um, China Beach, and they shot some stuff for Mash and different stuff. But anyway. They had rebuilt the whole thing out there, and they had the same building with the same interior out there. Mm. And so I walked into the morgue, and it was the same exact morgue that I saw in oh, this. You know, it was like, holy shit, look at this. Yeah. You know, it was identical. You really couldn't tell the difference. That's the magic of it. That's how, yeah. and it's so real. You know, right. that you're standing there. So I yeah, I haven't gotten to see any of our um, like Marvel or. Lucasfilm sets like the volume that they have that's all yeah. interior and they just kind of swap out the CG background but then you can have the ship and you can have the the stars coming at you and just really the actors instead of just like a big green screen which is horrible to work with because you're you know it just there's nothing there well, but, and so much of that gets shot over in London so it's not like you got to walk around the lot and oh look I can sit in the Millennium right. Falcon oh, right. today right, right, that right, would have been right, freaking right. cool right right <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. Just to know it was all going on around you was 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 kind of fun. Yeah, you feel like you're you're part of it. You know, it's really yeah. it's just even if you're not like even if you're a guest like me on the lot, it's just like you just feel like you're part of something so much bigger, and it's just you know it's just magical. It's a magical feeling. So yeah, so you did that, and then what have you done? Since? You know, obviously, you know, you had a, the misfortune of getting laid off, and, and when they were you know they were downsizing a lot of people, and you unfortunately got on that list. So. Mm -hmm uh what what have you been doing well so that was in uh july was like my last day with them and to their credit they they gave us a, a pretty good runway you know with with um severance pay and stuff like that so that you know you don't go immediately to the breadline so i had you know have several months kind of covered so that allowed me to be able to you know double down with some of the the book stuff and be able to you know, to, to launch my own, you know, the Bravo Bay shingle, you know, so yeah. the, whatever I do, if, if, if I do freelance work now, I can run that through the LLC, or if I do this other stuff, you know, books or trailers, book trailers, uh, any kind of marketing videos for other people, I can run that all through this business now. So to yeah, the that's like that, me, I have Boralis LLC, which is based on the planet, yeah. my original yeah, my saga of Davi Ray, the Boralis, uh, uh, Brawley Alliance, and the planet Boralis, and nice. that's what I do, and I run everything through Boralis, and and yeah. it, it's my, you know, my, my top shelf editing is kind of a subdivision of that, and everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, and to me, that 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 just simplifies everything. So you have that, you know, protective layer over over you, uh, and you know, once the uh, strikes are all over and and people all start going back to work, I, I feel like I'll get some more calls on all the resumes that I put out. But for now, again, I'm, I'm trying to keep busy with the new books and, and, and again, this being November. So, so you got laid off when? And like you got you 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 just li left in July, literally yeah. this July. Yeah. Yep. So you're still you're still in that cushion period. So that's yeah. good. Exactly. Exactly. So so that's that's what I'm. Um, so yeah. So that's that's what I'm trying to get as much of this other stuff kind of launched out there with with books and and things and get everything in place. So if I do have to go back to a full time job. You know, I'll, I'll do that, um, but to the extent that I can stay independent and keep doing my own stuff, then, because under that severance, I can't work for Disney unless I repay them the severance. So they, I have people from Disney calling me and saying, hey, are you available? And I'm like, 
not yet. <laughs> um, so yeah. that that time is coming to an end, and so that's that's an important part of the process too. So, yeah. Well, you know, and yeah, you know, with your experience, I think I should have you do a book trailer for me sometime. I'm sure you can do an awesome yeah. job. Yeah. I mean, those kind of yeah. things. I'm yeah. pretty amazed with CapCut and the technology, what we can do with some of this stuff now, even for TikTok. But yep. you know, um, I'm sure you could do even more amazing stuff with your with your stuff. But yeah, yeah. our yeah, last. I, our, let me just bring up our last guy was, um, you know, I helped him launch his book under our shingle. So that was, a, you know, a kingdom without a king. But it was a medieval sort of a Spanish kings and queens. So it was kind of like Game of Thrones meets, um, um, what was it, Orlando Bloom, Kingdom of Heaven. Kind yeah, of, yeah. Kind of, kind of like that sort of a deal. But I was able to find all kinds of great um, uh, footage, stock footage that I could repurpose, you know, so you can buy it for very cheap, you know, 35 you Pex for this shot. Pexels.com you know. Pexels has great stuff for free that you can yeah, download. Yeah, yeah. So I use them too for, for some of the, the yeah. global, but just the amount of stuff that they have available, um, less for like sci-fi, like for my yeah. specific story. I don't know yeah. if I could use that, but they have, they certainly have like the, the, all the general minutes. contemporary stuff they've got. Yeah. 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 They've got some of the nebulous stuff like that says sci-fi, like computery techie things and stuff that you can work into. Trailer. Yeah. yeah I, I, for my trailer, I was able to find uh, math equations on a, on a blackboard and, yeah. and rocket launches and yep. those kind of asked, you know, mm -hmm. those kind of things. So it worked out. Yeah. 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 They definitely have it, but it's, it's pretty amazing to me, all this stuff out there. But yeah, I bet you could, I mean, you, you probably could make a whole business of any number of things, but from editing trailers to even shooting okay. some stock footage and different things, right. I'm sure, because right. you've got right. all that experience. So right. you never know. So you know what? We've done all this. We've talked for 20 minutes and we haven't even really talked about his books. So since I brought him on as an author, I probably ought to let him tell us about his books. So the first book I edited was Battle Tides, which isn't coming out yet. We're going to save that for last. Let's talk about what you have out. What was your first book you actually released? The What's first up, Mike? Book the first book was a short story, you know, because I know you love those uh, those short story compendiums where it's all, you know, you get like 20 of them in, the, in a book and stuff like that. But so that was the first thing I did to historians proper. So that was, you know, a thinner one because it was 17,000 words. Uh, but that was. Oh, I got news for you, brother. That is not a short story. That's a novelette. <laughs> nice novelette because a short story is what ten thousand less uh, at nine thousand or less would be a short story uh okay. when you go above nine thousand it's a, a up between nine thousand and about thir twenty five thousand probably you'd have to okay. look at sifwa sifwa will tell you the uh, science fiction fetty writers of america has pretty much the industry standard for what okay. what the actual divisions are and then above above like 25k it's a it's a no it's a novella something like that but anyway okay. yeah so that was or maybe it's 20. Favorite. I don't remember. It might be 20K. I don't remember. But anyway, right. yeah, that is a solid novelette. Congrats. <laughs> it is a solid. So I was able to test drive the whole process from hiring my friend Frank Capizzuto, who did the, he does concept art and stuff for right. the front. Uh, and so he was able to give me all of his 3D designs afterwards and all that, where I was able to actually get into blender and cut a trailer so that was that was kind of fun oh that's cool so you basically you hired him as a cover artist but then he gave you all his 3d designs for yes. what he did yes. yeah because he that's cool. they don't all do this but he did his his concept art he would go in and place all the ships and everything and all the lighting inside this 3d software and then he would get his 2d frame and then he would polish it up in photoshop so i was able to get all those elements this future japanese city Neo yeah. Tokyo and the the ship that he had created, and then I just kind of all I had to do was wiggle no, them around. Very a little. cool. I mean, that's what that's what modern technology with art can do. I mean, you're yeah, yeah. bringing the world alive just to give you one flat image. I mean, that's pretty freaking cool. Exactly. Exactly. So, and yeah. he just liked being able to have all the control he could do of just moving it down an inch or moving it over and not having to redraw the whole thing. So yeah, yeah, so yeah. That, that worked for him. So it was he was he was, and he's the one that was doing the cover for. Uh, battle tides so okay uh, so that one's that one he's he's working on and uh he's done several iterations so now that he knows so, he has till may he's like all right we're gonna try this and I'm like, oh. well that was your first what was it is it nova boy or bova boy which one the your the name of your company i'm reading it behind oh, you but oh, part bravo, of it's bay. bravo bravo bay books bravo bay okay yeah sorry the the, the r and the b are cut off on the yeah, side yeah, yeah, yeah. Why they, i was trying to read it <laughs> <laughs> there you go Bravo. Probably. now i could read it okay and again like you did that was that was a um a place in my next book 
where all the fighter pilots is like their Area 51 where they test drive all their new ships in this Bravo Bay location. And so yeah. I was like, that's the name of it's my It's a company. great name to pull. Yeah, 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 yeah. And it's kind of it's kind of your thing. So yeah. that that book went out and you put it out obviously as your own as your own thing. You hired yep. somebody to help you with the formatting or did you do all that yourself? Uh, that one I had a I brought in an editor for that and that's that's why I was learning about for for editors it's it's tricky because you almost have to do like casting for editors like you're fantastic with the sci-fi stuff you know the world you're from it but this first lady I did she she was good with the uh, young adult kind of fiction but that one she was like oh this is this reminds me of the story the enemy strikes back I was like you mean the Empire Strikes Back? I was like, warning, warning. See, why didn't you call me for that one? I could have done that one for you. <laughs> yeah, you could have. Yeah, that was, like I said, that was the early, early stages. So, but that's, yeah, yeah. that's where I learned that lesson. It's like, all right, not every editor can handle every. every well, you know, and I do, I actually do a lot of mystery and, and I don't just do sci-fi. I do a lot of stuff, but I get you. You know, there are things I won't do. I'll be like, no, I'm not the best guy yeah, for yeah, this. Exactly, you know, exactly. You know. Uh, uh, yeah. Romance. I do a limited no amount of editing on romance, even though I write romance, because romance is very formula, and and the 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 audience is looking for that formula, and I, I don't always know the formula, so I will make sure that people get that, because that right. that's what sells the books is that there's a certain you know if you're doing a harem romance or you're doing a boy meets girl or whatever, there's a certain formula you really need to hit all the beats, and if you don't hit all the beats, you know you your fans the fans will not come. So yeah, yeah. So yeah, exactly. And that's what I love because your expertise, especially in the sci-fi field, my my uh, subtitle was Battle Tides, the Pirate Slayer. And the first thing you said was like, eh, pirates aren't, you know, that's 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 like not a good thing to have in in a lot, you know. It's, well, they're it's, very cliche. The yeah, very space cliche. Pirates have, yes. space, space pirates have been done a billion freaking times, right, so it's right. very cliche. It comes off so, as cliche. So being able to like just but just something like that, it's like, all right, take that off the title and then, you know, change them to like a ranger or something else, you know, something else within the book. Well, give them a different name. Don't call them pirates. They can be pirates. Right. It's right. Fine, exactly. but don't start. Don't start out by giving yourself a handicap by using the term that everybody, exactly. a lot of people go, oh, no, not pirates again. Right. So that's that's what I love because I, I was thinking the same thing. Oh, it's pirates. like with Pirates of the Caribbean. Okay, when Disney took a shot at that, people were like, Do we need another pirate movie? The last movie, oh, Pirates of Penzance was a total disaster. Do we need another pirate? But it was so freaking cool that people didn't care. They yeah. were like, Oh, this is awesome. Yeah. So you can reinvent it. It's just, you know, right. you want to make sure your title doesn't give away something that, that makes people say pull away instead of coming toward it. Exactly. Right. 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 Yeah. So that was um, so that was that was good. That was super helpful for for all the feedback you gave on that. Um, the the next two was what I did was we had written some feature films scripts. So my friend and I, he's in uh, Fayetteville, North Carolina, and he's he was able to take our our feature film scripts and um, you know do a low budget you know kind of movies off of those. So he had one that was, you know, he had one that was called Masquerade, one that was called Restoration that, you know, Restoration actually got picked up by um, uh, Sony Home Pictures. So, oh. Well, so, cool. so my, what I wanted to do was novelize those two because, you know, when you've got a low budget thing, you know, your casting is not necessarily perfect, your locations you had to get out of because the guy was coming back, you know, whatever. So, uh, so I was able to take the scripts and the characters that I liked and really be able to polish them out and, and kind of smooth out the story for for the next two books. So those were more like why well, you did your own novelizations. That's pretty correct. Cool. Correct. So those uh, and again, it was just all in the service of all right. How can I get some some of my IP out there to market? How can I continue to get better at honing my skill as an author, working with editors? working with people on the um, the cover design. So I, you know, just trying to get better and better at this through the process so that I can make a more, more and more competent sort of a product. So yeah, 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 yeah. And that's, and that's important. I think, you know, you guys out there, you should always want to be better at what you're doing. You want to be the best because that's what people do look for quality, you know, and, and, and they'll forgive you early on if they know you're early on, but if your books don't get better as you go, but they get worse, you got a problem. Or if your books don't go anywhere, man, it'll be like, ah, we've seen him. He's yeah, this the stupid David Acuff. He's doing the same thing he did ten books ago. I'm bored with him, right. which is not what you want, you know. Right, exactly. That, you know. And so there's such a that David Acuff. He keeps reinventing himself. That's what you want, man. Right. He's oh, yeah, 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 exactly. 
Uh, and, and there's such a stigma too with self-publishing. And I've, I've got a lot of friends that I was asking their opinions because they had self-published some things. And, and some of them were just, the front looked like clip art. Uh, the inside, the margins were all, it was just, it just looked terrible. And so I, you know, again, being a professional filmmaker, you know, and having every frame is, is, is important and the design and the marketing aspect is super important. So I wanted to make sure that I had all those things. Well, the thing, you know, self-publishing doesn't have as many stigma as it used to, but the reality is the reason there's stigma are because people don't know what they're doing and they just put shit out there. Exactly. And so it looks like crap. Right. And so people come in there and they compare it to a New York book and they say, this is, this is cheesy. Right. And, and, and I don't think there's a lot of self-published people don't even realize you can't just slap any cover on your book and put it out there. You can't just publish your manuscript without proper formatting. People right. have done it. You will get mocked and people will look at you and they will never buy another book from you. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and it's legit criticism. You need to make an effort. If you, there's no reason this book had absolutely nothing to do with New York. And you, I, I defy you not to open this book and see it looks like any New York book. Right. It's just as well laid right. out, it's exactly. just as well edited. I'm going to yep. take my little thing off for a minute so I can show them this because <laughs> it, it really is important. Hold on a second. I can just take this right off. Da, 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 da. All right, shut this off. And then you'll see that I'm actually relaxing on the bed. <laughs> the, the layout has to look professional. Yeah. You know, yep. I've got extra, you've got to have extra layout touches. I have... Uh, the chapter headings have to look where they're supposed to. I even have little diagrams instead of asterisks separating my. I put in the extra touch. The right. covers, cover art's fantastic. You want everything to look good so that when people get your book, they it looks like a New York book. It exactly. matters. It yep. matters to people because it, it's professionalism. So yeah, yep. that's what he's talking about, and that's where the stigma comes from. A lot of people are not professional about what they do, and as a result. Uh, in the early days of self-publishing, in particular, it became a it became a joke that uh, you know you could always tell a self-published book because it looks like it looks like an amateur at work. Right. But right. Nowadays, you shouldn't be able to. So yeah, that's what he's talking about. So I don't want I'm, I don't want anybody to think that you're bad mouthing self-publishing because you're obviously not. But you you're know, I am self-publishing, so that's yeah, that's no, the. You're talking about a level of professionalism. And that's right, 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 right. It's got to look because the thing was like this this other guy that we helped publish his book. He when we, when he went into uh, Barnes and Noble, he was like, "Hey, yeah, I've, I've, I'm I'm getting this book out, and uh, we'd like to do like a, a book signing here." And they're like, "Well, okay, let us." You know, he's like, "Got a copy of it if you want to look at it." So they looked at it, and they're like, "Ooh," you know, and that's what you want. You want the "Ooh, okay, this isn't," you know, because with the indie authors that come in, they get the gamut of you know, ooh, to, ugh. you know, so you want to land in the ooh kind of range. Yeah, true. And, you know, it's, it's not, and it, it, you, you, it, you can actually put it out very affordably. Like I trade services with people for different things. Like I, my editor works for me trading services. My, one of my audio book guys does, he's a professional actor. He does narration for me and I edit stuff for him and, or his kids or whatever. And, and we trade services and things like that. And that, you know, is, I can put a book out for three, four hundred dollars, but you know, sometimes if you find, usually if you hire an editor, you're going to have to spend probably by the time you're done at least a thousand dollars on your book plus your formatting and so on, maybe more mm -hmm. in some cases, depending on how thick your book is and how much work it needs, and depending on how many people you have to hire. But my point is this: you can still do it affordably, and as you, as the more you get to know it, and the more stuff you're able to learn how to do yourself, the more you can do it affordably. Yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, and so. Yep, and that's that's where with 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 all the extras that go with it, all the uh, the extra you know social media videos and the trailers and all those other things I need. So that's that's all in my wheelhouse. So it uh, so I don't have that's not a that's not any kind of a spin for me to be able to. Okay, so the up. second book was like the Masquerade, and what was the other one that you did that was the movie? Yeah, there was a uh, High School Masquerade, and then there was the Wrestling Girl. A wrestling girl, okay. A uh, high school girl wrestler who's having to wrestle against the boys because there wasn't a lot of girls wrestling in high school. So she's yeah. kind of forced to compete at this level, which is which is very tough. So, all right, uh, yeah, and I that so that's three of the books I see on the back there. You've got a, a few more on there. So, well, what else is going on there? Well, Let's when see. I turned fifty, I wanted to do like a semi memoir that encompassed a lot of my comedy and everything like that, my stand up and stuff. So. Uh, this one's called uh, Semi Centurion. Uh, what doesn't kill you makes you funnier. There you go. So, um, and I told you guys, by the way, 
Be sure and like us so we get more of an audience here, and be sure and follow Scruffy TV there, Mr. Day. He's also got an account at, is it at David it's Acuff? The, the David Acuff on the David Acuff. TikTok and then on Instagram and stuff. It's it's all David Acuff. Like on me. I'm the Brian Thomas S. He, on social media, he's the yeah. David Acuff. So look for that, <laughs> and you can find him and uh, follow him and see what he's doing because I'm telling you, he's doing some really creative, cool, funny videos, and he – He's created a kind of a humorous personality around his what he's doing. And mm-hmm. his kids come on there and market and do all this yep. stuff. Yep. So, so and, and, and to me, the, that was the whole thing is like, all right, you get tired of waiting for the gatekeepers to let you in to the to play uh, in, in, in this publishing world, stuff like that. So this was a way of, hey, I'm, I'm going to write it. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. I'm going to get my stuff out there and then I'm going to move on to the next one and just keep. Well, what, what you're doing is the, the advan- with self-publishing, you're letting the readers be the gatekeepers. The readers oh, yeah. are saying you, you're, yeah. we like you or we don't yeah. like you. Yep. And uh, if 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 we continue like what you're putting out, we'll continue to support it. If we don't, well, we're gone. You know. Mm-hmm. So uh, it's okay to make mistakes. It's okay to not be perfect. Uh, the good thing is you have a sense. You know, I, I try to. You know me. I try to have a sense of humor about it too. You have a sense of humor about it, and that what works works out real well for you. I mean, you played it up real well. I mean, I've really. I remember because. Um, if I recall, when I first met you, you didn't have much of a social media imprint, and you made a really a lot of progress. Right, right. No, it's it, that was in the last few years. That was that's what I realized was if I if I have to have eyeballs in order to help some of these sales and to be able to draw some some of the conversation that you have with people, then I needed to up my game. And so so yeah, so Instagram, I've you know it's about it's about five thousand. Um, you know, followers and stuff and people that I'm interacting with on a regular basis. Um, and, and LinkedIn, I think I bumped that as like 20,000 people that I'm connected with. So trying to use that as a professional yeah, LinkedIn is huge. Yeah. 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 So that with, with again, some comedy bits up there, but again, mostly it's, it's the more professional side of the, the book bins. Like we just talked about the Barnes and Noble book signing that we just did last, uh, Saturday. Uh, so, th- you know, that's something I would post on, on LinkedIn. Now, are the books uh, in Barnes & Noble or did they just yeah. let you do a signing? No, we, we did a, uh, because I had to go through Ingram Sparks to make sure that my book was available through their system. But once you do that, then um, Barnes & Noble is like, yes, your book's in our system. So we can do a consignment, first of all, where your book can just be on our shelf. You know, we'll take a few copies and sell them. But then we did a uh, the event where we had a table in the back, we had like 30 chairs, then we had like 40 people showing up between me and and Frank, you know, we did a co-signing because I never wanted to be the person that was just at a table. You know, you hear about all those stories where you do a book signing and nobody stands in line. So we made sure well, we did I mean, a lot it of- It can happen. Months. I mean, I, I've had that happen, but I also always have friends show up. So I have somebody yeah, to talk exactly. to and I'll, then I'll talk to people as they walk by. If they look, right. even if they even remotely make the mistake of looking over, then I've got it. <laughs> but so, so, so we just try to make literally sure walk have... by, trying not to look at you because they don't oh, want yeah. you. To... Yeah, they do that. They're like, uh... they do. It's, it's so like, fun. Hey, and, and my get my my goal is to try to um, get their attention so they come over and at least talk to me. And sometimes they talk to you and you have a great conversation. So they, oh, they'll, they'll, they'll be like, I'll be. Ba-, but I love the I'll be back to buy a book. I'm like, yeah, I lost them. They're not coming back. They'll never come back and buy that book. Right. If they don't buy it right then, they're not going to buy it. Right, right. You know, uh, but it, it, it's one of those things where uh, that's part of the challenge. But, yeah, there's nothing worse than sitting there and having nobody buy anything. And I've had that happen a few times. It's, it's that, That's why we were trying to game the system so that we had we had so many of our friends and family that was going to be showing up. And we had, um, you know, all the invites that we sent out that to really lock people into RSVP to – to come and just just stuff like that and this is our hometown crowd for for la so so we knew we we could pull a you know you know get the job yeah. done and have because barnes and noble was real happy with the results and how many books we sold so they're now how willing to sell me i so we just sold about 25 all total so yeah see that's a great showing that's a great yeah. show so to say yeah. if you sell 25 to 30 books at a book signing that's success. A lot of people would think, oh, that's not very much. Because, I mean, I know people that can move 100, 250 books at a book signing. But those are the big name people. Right, right. Uh, most of the smaller guys, if you sell 20 books, they're really happy. You oh, moved yeah. a lot of product. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. so that was and, – and that was working with this guy, you know, trying to manage some expectations as well. Yeah. And, and just because, again, 
when you're co-signing the book or, or uh, consigning the book with Barnes and Noble, he was like, how many copies you want? You want like 50 copies? And they're like, no, we just need three because you know, again, we're just testing the waters. So, so yeah, that's, what they do. that's what they do. And with me, they actually order them in and uh, you know, I have a, I don't have any returns, so they don't have to, they'll, they don't have to send them back. Uh, they have to sell them, but they take a chance because my books, you know, they like yeah, me and they've had me. I've, I have so many books in their store already. Right. That, you know, I come in and do signings so they can always move product when I come in. No, that's great. That's great. So that's the level we got to get to. But right now yeah. we're just, a, you know, just getting I didn't even know they do so. To be honest with you, that's the first time I ever heard that Barnes & Noble does consignment. So that's an interesting thing. That may be a change. It's not, uh, you know, every branch is different. So, but just the one here in Burbank is just yeah. really open to working with indie authors. And so they have a whole section and they, they create little, um, you know, things around similar authors. So they're very helpful and very friendly uh, and, and, uh, very cool. Very but, cool. So, yeah. So that was, that was good. So that was kind of a bucket list item book signing in Barnes and Noble. Check. <laughs> yeah. It's cool. And they make you that poster with the Barnes and Noble logo on it. Up you yep. and the whole deal. And yep. so I still have some of those hanging in my, I have one of them hanging on my file cabinet in my office. It's, it's, nice. it's there, you know, it's cool. Yeah. You really feel like you've made it when you can walk in that store and see your book on the shelf. It's like, Oh my God, there I am. You know, it's a really cool feeling. I had a, a professor back in, in college and he was he was an English professor because he'd written some Southern fiction that took off. And so he was telling a story about one time where he was doing a book signing. So he was over on this side of Barnes and Noble and this other guy, no name was on the other side and the other poor guy had nobody in line. And so once he got through his whole line, he went over and bought a book from the guy, had him sign it and stuff like that. And he just kind of like a pity sign, but he was, he yeah. was just wanting to connect with this other author. Well, that turns out that was John Grisham. <laughs> so, so now fast forward three years later and John Grisham's got like eight movies out and bestsellers and all this thing. And then, then the other guy is, is teaching in, in a, in a college, which is you know kind of where he wanted to be. So that was fine. But, but again, just the different levels of, Nobody standing in line does not mean anything. No, that's how everybody starts. It's how yeah. everybody starts. Yeah. And I know people who are big name people who have those kind of signings every once in a while still. It just happened the wrong night, you know. Yeah, I've right. driven three, four hours to a bookstore to do a sign and had nobody show up because it just was the wrong night. And it's right. embarrassing. Right. You feel like, oh, I really failed the store. But the store is <laughs> like, eh, eh, it happens sometimes, you know. Yeah. They'd obviously rather move some product. But, you, oh, you sold right. one or two. You're good. You're good. You've made some sales. So. Yeah, yeah. You know, they're usually gracious about it because they know it's an up and down business. That's just the way it is. Mm -hmm. But anyway, so let's talk about if you guys want to ask questions. Sorry, I got a little behind inviting you to ask questions, but we got about 18 minutes left in the show. We might go a little long today because David and I are having a good time. But if you guys want to, if, unless David has to run out. But yeah, if you guys want to um, ask questions, feel free. We'll try to answer the questions. In the meantime, we want to talk about Battle Tides. So Battle Tides is the book I edited for him. We told you a little bit about it. It's kind of a military sci-fi epic thing. So what's going on with that? You're planning to release it in May. Have you have you 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 finished all the edits I gave you? Have you run it through another editor? Have you what's no, your no, what, no. where are you with that book? So I still have to uh, in the next month is is where I've kind of set the time for myself to be able to take all the notes that you gave and and like you said, one of your first notes to me was how long has this been on the back burner? Because you, you wanted some space between when I wrote it to let it get vegetate a little bit. And so now it's it's had some time to be fresh. For two years, dude. <laughs> <laughs> no, like I said, if, if, if I didn't have like four other books coming out, I would have been like, I need to get this out. But um, again, so getting back to it, doing this next final draft, I do need to do an editorial pass of the person that's like the grammar Nazi that can be like, eh, more semicolons, you know, that kind of stuff. But um, but yeah, then it's, it's it's very close. So then I need to do the trailer and, and all those kind of things. But yeah, one more good solid pass um, with your notes front and center to be able to clean everything up. As I recall, that should be good. That should get it where it needs right, to go. Right. Right. And it's so, been two years though, but yeah, that's what my memory is too. Is that it just needed a lot? Of, it just needed some cleanup and some some things moved around a little bit in a few spots and all of that clarification of the timeline, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and just making cool. sure for myself that the world is as present as it is in in my mind on the page. You know, and given the, well, the readers... you got to do is you got at least you got at least do a pass with either somebody reading it to you or read it aloud yourself. You oh, got yeah. it. Oh, you yeah. got to do that because you'll find most of the stuff you find that 
will will be if you force yourself to read it aloud because you'll find the 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 you'll find where the two the's and the one where your mind will just skip over it when you're reading but you won't you know you'll find stuff where you're like oh my god i repeated that phrase too much or these sentences all sound like the she said this she said this she said oh crap i gotta fix that you know all of that i think is really important and and the only way you find that is reading it aloud is, right. and you also get a sense of the flow and the pace and all that. Yeah. And it, it's really great. I mean, it, you know, and there's, there's, there's software programs that can do it for you now, but uh, it's definitely worth doing. Well, and, and a very important part of a lot of people's process, but mine included is, is that, um, you know, that beta reader process where yeah. you know, giving out to some, some friends that read this kind of stuff all the time where it's like, all right, all right, here's the, here's the, Next big one, so your feedback's gonna get included into this, so make sure you really sit with the material and, and make sure you do as long as, as long as they know you're willing to let them be mean, that's the main oh, issue, because yeah. oh, a lot yeah. of people just wanna hurt your feelings. Yeah, yeah. You know I mean? They, you know what I mean. Not mean on purpose, but just that they're not gonna hurt your feelings and oh, yeah, ruin yeah. the friendship. Yeah. And I tell them up front, it's like, now I'm, if I wanted a gold star from mom, I would go get a gold star from mom and let her, you know, I'm not looking for that. I says, I want you to find, rip into the hole, you know, are there any holes that it has or plot holes that I missed out or characters that this didn't make sense for? I'll just yeah. show my notes. You'll say, look, this guy already ripped me a new one. Come on. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, so, you know, that's, that's what I'm looking for. And, and, you know, that, that thick skin is, you know, that comes with having written now for 20 years or whatever. So for in very, well, it's, also, it's also part of the business you've been in with Disney, but also, yeah. I mean, let's just face it. Let's just face it. You, you, you did a lot of good work on bad movies or bad shows or shows that bombed. And, right. and, you know, you could still be proud of your work, but you, everybody's like, Oh, trashing it. And you're like, man, right. I would, you know, I, I wish I, we did a really cool thing for that. I wish people would appreciate that, but they hate the movie. They don't want to see it. Right. That kind of thing. Right. Or, or for that matter, the simple fact is, you know, you, you also have to keep in mind that, that if you think the the people that are helping you that you ask are hard on you or people like me who you pay why don't you get out there with the readers i mean you'll get a, i got a really crappy review on something today and i had I'm, i actually laughed at it because it was so absurdly wrong i was just like oh my god he said there's no good famous stories in this book and i was like what we published like 20 it's my robot through the ages we published 20 of the most famous all-time stories of all time as reprints in that book they wow. are the most award women and you're saying there's no good known stories in that you you wow. don't know what the hell you're talking about i had to laugh at the guy right. <laughs> um. so you know you but you you can do that because you know you know that you that that they're wrong if right. you don't know that they're wrong and they're tearing you a new one that's when it's painful right right, right. exactly yeah. yep so, so having those people to help you identify those problems so you could fix them before they go out, that's the trick. Right. Hell, I had shortcut out there. I just found out that there's somehow some page, one page got inserted, one blank page, and the first ten books that went out that were print, the the page the chapter started on the wrong side of the page, and the title page was on the back side of a page <laughs> instead of on the front side. Wow. It was it, you know there, an extra blank page got put in. Uh -huh. And instead of the the title page ended up being on the inside cover, you know, inside cover, instead. And I was like, holy crap! So I had to pull those files back and fix those. Right. I, you know, now people have a collector's edition because yeah, exactly. Is, you know, it's embarrassing for me because I'm like, oh my god, I'm a professional, you know. <laughs> I thought we'd had everything fixed and I'd worked really hard. To, there was a couple typos and stuff, and I'd fixed a bunch of stuff, and that somehow got screwed up. So I mean, stuff happens. Yeah. You know? oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And and as much back and forth as you go with that that final couple weeks with with getting everything perfect and stuff, it's it's. Yeah, it gets crazy. It was a lesson to me because I didn't look. All I looked for in the proof were the pages that I fixed. I did not look at that. And I was like, shit, that was my mistake. I approved it that way. Uh -huh. It was like that. I should have made an effort to. Now, that's one more thing I have to double check every time. As long as I, as long as all the chapters start on an odd numbered page, I'm good. That's right. the thing you have to remember. Your chapters always start on an odd numbered page. And, and that's, that's a hard part of the process because you're now. You're you're satiated with the, your material. You've read it so many times that your eyes are bleeding, exactly. and now you get the the preview copy, and you're like, "All right, I've got a fresh eyes. Are all the page numbers? Are all this and all that?" You know what? I mean, you, sometimes you skip those details because you're just like, "I've looked at this enough, man. This is I just fixed one thing. How can it be?" But oh, the right. whole thing got screwed up because something happened. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yep, that's crazy. That's the major, and I mean, I'm this is like, I'm a guy. That's like my thirty seventh book to come out. So. You'd think I'd have it down to a but not self-publishing, not self-publishing. So 
Dang. This was a small press deal, but I was doing a lot of the behind the scenes stuff. So anyway, it is what it is. But yeah. So we'll... stuff happens. So anyway. Yeah. So Ballantides is gonna come out hopefully in May. Yep. And uh and, and you'll have that out. And then what comes next? What's next for you? Uh I wanna go back to turning some of my screenplays that are just collecting dust on the shelf, turning those into um turning those into to stories and, and novelizations. One, one of the things we had the opportunity to do when I was at Disney, they did this thing called Pitchapalooza, where any employee could come in and pitch them to ABC or Freeform, uh, pitch them an idea for a TV show. So that's yes. so I, I took that opportunity. Nothing ever came up from it, but what I realized is some of the things I was pitching were like characters I'd been working on for 10 years that I loved. And if they had wanted to, they could have just, you know, paid me, taken my stuff, and then it's gone. And I was like, yeah, that wasn't very smart. So well, I, yeah. I determined that I wanted to have all my stuff in, in print first as, as my own IP, my own novel. And then if they want to take it and and, and take the, the two girls in Idaho and turn them into two hamsters on Mars, they can do whatever they want. <laughs> At well, least. you know, when I started out, my, my saga of Davi Ree was an idea I had when I was 15 years old. Okay. And it was the Star Wars, the Moses story still like Star Wars, but I didn't know how to write it until I was like 27. Then I started working on it. Yep. Well, then the, the when I started a new series after I got those three done, I was figuring out what to do. And I'd done a few other things. And I said, I, I really want this love, this script of mine called Simon Says. Hmm. And it was a script about this, this uh, old school cop back in the 90s when AIDS first came out, right? In the late 80s, 90s. Yep. And he had to team with an HIV positive partner. Well, back in those days, he, you know, there was the homophobia thing and the whole angle, and that played really well as comedy. Mm -hmm. But by the time I decided to do it, I was like, no, that's just going to make everybody hate this main character, and it's yeah. not going to play. So instead, I made him a technophobe, and he had to work with a robot, and it worked. It worked great for comedic gold, nice. and turned it into this novel, and made Simon Says, and turned it into a whole series. Right. And I, that was a screenplay that I adapted, so it was great. Yeah. You know? And yeah. I, now I'm looking at other scripts that I've gotten, going, man, I could do yeah. this too. So. Exactly. So, and there's a script that I haven't sold, and I'm like, that could turn that into a novel you know I, and all I that totally would because yeah. they're, they're out there mining all these areas for for material and you know and, and for their mine your, own, and mine your own area for material exactly. yeah yeah so, <laughs> so so it's it's yeah I'd, I'd highly encourage anybody that's a script writer i was like you guys need to get in on this and start pushing your novels out because well prose is a prose is a different, a different muscle it, it, it's a different skill set you have yeah. to learn how to write differently that yeah, is dude. i can that's always fun. tell when I'm editing a book by a guy who's a screenwriter, mm. I can always tell it's a first book by a screenwriter because they always make the same mistakes mm. over and over yeah, again. Yeah. Because there's certain things you do in a script that you don't do. Now I got my my bachelor's degree in screenwriting, so I I learned all that stuff. Mm -hmm. But then I had to learn how to do the prose thing. Right. So I know what the pitfalls are, and I know what gears I switch when I write a screenplay. Yeah, exactly. So it it makes it easier for me. But it is definitely a different thing. Not that they it, couldn't do it. Of course they could. It, but you do have to work on it. You know yeah. how? Do, I'm going to ask you that. So what's your writing process now? Now, when you when you write, you know you've come a ways. How, what software do you use? What's your? Do you have a, ha a habit? Do you have like a routine? What do you do? You know, I'm I'm still I'm still on Microsoft Word uh, for now, except for, for for screenplays. I'm obviously with like Final Draft, but yeah. for for the uh, the prose stuff, I'm still in Microsoft Word. Uh, and then I'll uh, a lot of times when I when I sit down to write. I create a um, I've created a journal for each book that I that I've written so that I can go into the journal, write the day's date, how many words I've written, you know, up to oh. this point and then the date. And then I just kind of free form it just like uh, where did I leave off yesterday? What what? Uh, genius idea that I have in the shower that that I'm going to work on. You don't have an outline or anything. You're just kind of like uh, you're you're just kind of pantsing it. Uh, some I now I saw one of your 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 other interviews and it's very similar to your process. I need those those uh, the Sid Field you know those four or five elements. I need to know the the Big Bang open how it all comes out of the gate. Yeah, the inciting need, incident. Yep, I, and I need to know the um, uh, at the end of Act One. You know the turning point one plot point one. Yeah. I need to know the midpoint of where everything reverses and kind of goes the other direction. I need to know the low of lows. And then I know need to kind of have an idea of the 
conclusion of how it how it's going to wrap up. Block point two and the climax. Those are the terms that Sid Feel uses. But yep. yeah, you got yeah. You'll you'll notice familiarity to that Brandon out. Brandon's one of our audience members. I was telling him what he needed to know to write Act Two because yeah, he just yeah. got through Act One, right. and I was telling him you need to know the midpoint and you need to know that turning point at the end, and then you've got to do you finish your ascending arc toward the midpoint, and then your descending arc starting there towards your climax. Yep, yep. Yeah, I'm, and and it's you know what they've repackaged that. It's it's saved the cat now. Yeah. It's the seven. It's the seven point structure and it's funny every time i hear about it and people raving about oh it saved my career and i start reading these books i'm like well shit i learned this 30 years ago yes. from sid field this is him and sid field learned it from aristotle it's the same yeah. thing yeah. being recycled yeah. which is why it works yeah. it is exactly you know it, in western storytelling it is the thing i mean you can and you argue or you can argue it into a four or a five act structure like the television people do right. Right. but really it still is the three act structure i always Every story I do is the three act, but you know, Rocky's a good example of one that works as a four act story, and that was brilliant. Um, and you know, so I become kind of an expert on structure. I actually teach it a lot awesome. because I learned all that so years ago. In fact, today I was just repacking stuff in my garage, and I unfortunately uh, uh, had to repack some boxes that got wet, and I uncovered all my old Sid Field and all those old books. I said, "Oh my God, I got to save these books. Yeah, yeah. These are like the core of my writing. These are the books I've got to have." You know. I said these have to be dug out of this box and put on my writing shelf, man. These yeah. are these are the books I'm always telling people to go. I don't have an example gold. of. It, you know? Yeah, it was gold. Yeah. You know yeah. what? I, what I loved about um, I heard Aaron Sorkin talking one time about kind of his process because somebody was asking him, does he uh, take a character and do that whole thing where you do an interview with your character, or you write down yeah. all these things, and he's like, no, 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 because he found that if he starts writing about their favorite color and their favorite, you know, muffin that they eat for breakfast, then he's going to try and work that into the script, you know, somewhere that's not organic to the way the story is. So he will wait until they're sitting in a diner and they order the food. He's like, all right, then he stops to think about, all right, what muffin or what, what would this guy order in the thing? And then it comes out. But, you know, initially he's like, no, I don't do all that. So I was yeah, like, oh, people, he's a pants you know, it's true. Some people need to know that information to write. I don't, and, and so I can do it. I mean, sometimes it's good to find it out later. Uh, some people do these extensive character biographies exactly. and stuff. It's great, right. but I always tell people, just because you wrote it doesn't mean. if I mean, if you really know your world as well as you need to know to write it, then only you're lucky if 30% of that will end up in the actual book. Right. right. You're lucky if you get 30 <laughs> Exactly. More likely 20, 25 percent. The rest of who would have it's the rest of it. Well, you save it for later books, or it's just yeah. stuff that you know. Yeah. yeah. And you can do interviews with people who ask you deep questions, who paid attention to the book, and you can answer their questions because you right. know. That's right. <laughs> but you're just the god of the universe. You yeah. know, that's just the way it is. That's uh it, it's different. I'm mean, not very many people write them anymore, but there was such a thing as a milieu story where the world was a character and story. The master of this, of course, is J.R.R. Tolkien. Oh. Middle Earth is a character in, in The Lord of the Rings mm -hmm. and to some degree in The Hobbit. And as a result, he knew so much about that world and he put so much of it into his stories. But that's because he was writing a milieu story where milieu was a whole part of the point. That's why we, he would have these long passages of description. But it's not a very popular form these days sure. and you don't see it very often because a lot of readers won't tolerate it now it's when it's written as beautifully as what tolkien wrote people put up with it but even then there's still passages i hear people like yeah i just skip ahead of that i i i, I didn't want to read about tom bombardil one more time or something you know or i didn't want to hear about the you know i didn't need another uh, lecture on the Ent, the Ent wives yeah. you know or whatever you know yeah. i'm just saying um uh, i don't think game of thrones is one i don't think uh, Tom, that George wouldn't even tell you that. I've, I've actually sat down and had conversations with George R. R. Martin. I've worked with him on projects. I don't think George would tell you that it was a milieu story either, but he certainly has a big milieu, and it's an important part of it. But yeah. it's still about, at its heart, it's still about characters, and it's about, it's actually about a history of families, Family. families in conflict. That's yeah. the heart of that one. Mm -hmm. It's not really about a world because the world itself isn't a character without the people who inhabit it but middle earth itself is a character is a character in tolkien it's, it's you find distinction but it is an important one the person who really lays it out well is orson scott card in his settings and description book where he talks about what a milieu book is it's it's a worthwhile book to check out 
But I'm not saying you can't do it. I'm just saying it's rare these days. But anyway, yeah. I, I looked at one of his other books. It was the uh, Orson Scott card. I think it was the uh, characters or something characters and where he was, it was, it was just great. to. Oh yeah. To, he, there's a whole bunch of writer's digest books that he and other people have done where he's he really great. good. And how to write a novel. You'll see a list of them in the back. And I actually used his books, uh, character and voice, I think is what it's called. But anyway, yeah, yeah I, I used, I used his two books in there extensively. He's a very good, whatever you think of his, view of, of homosexuality, and I certainly don't agree with him. The simple fact is he's a very good writer. He's also one of the nicest men I ever met, hmm. and he's an excellent teacher. He's an excellent teacher. So whatever you think of his politics or his religion, uh, put that aside because when it comes to craft, he knows what he's doing. He does. And uh, if you can put, get past all that and, and get into it, you can learn a lot. You can learn a lot. And hmm. it have nothing to do with any of that. And that's why I got that, that book because that was the first wall that I hit going from uh, from screenplays to novels was, all right, there's, it's not just present tense, you know, you, you, can, you can be third person, you can be, uh, you know, omniscient, you just had a lot of choices that I didn't have writing the scripts. It's like, all right, I had to stop and really think yeah, about this. All scripts are really omniscient. Yeah. They're yeah. really omniscient. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Um, so, and so omniscient present. So he's, he's picking up the gun and he's running toward the door. Yeah, and what you can't, what you can do in a script, but you can't do in a novel is you can actually have a car's point of view. You can actually have the point of view of an inanimate object. Right. From the desk, we see right. such, we, we pan past the feather pen and the inkwell to this, and then we open up and there's a stack of books over here. And one of them is this and standing in front, grab, and then a hand reaches up and grabs that book off the shelf. That's the point of view of the desk. You can't do that in a novel. Right. Because that is something that, it has to be a person inside somebody's head. It's the right. difference. It's right. one of the differences, you know. Uh, and and it's, it, some people call it the camera's eye view, but it really is, it is a point of view. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So it's one of those things. So where can people find you? If people want to find you, we already talked a little bit about this. Uh, we kind of run out of time. And I mean, I could go on and on and on, but I want to make sure people can find you. So our <laughs> guest is David Acuff, mm -hmm. also S. David Acuff in some cases, but you can just find the David a cuff mm -hmm. at TikTok at uh, Instagram yep, on Instagram and, and all the others. I'm just David a cuff. So I was, I was David early David enough David. to the game where I was able to get that on TikTok and, and um, on Facebook Instagram. and so on. Yeah. Facebook. So, and then, you know, David a I'm, I'm posting a bunch of, uh, a bunch of stuff fairly regularly as far as the new. And you have a link on your profile at TikTok for them to order your books. I not on the scruffy one. I th I think it's on um on the David Acuff. I do. Yeah, the David Acuff. You go there and you click, and you know you can order my books off of my link too. So please do check them out. Give us reviews. Give us book talk reviews, but also give us reviews on Amazon, dude. Those are the lifeblood of how we sell books. I can't say enough how much that helps us. Um. Anyway, so David's got a lot of stuff out. You can check out his um, cent cent what is it centenarian. Semi-Centurion. Semi-Centurion. He's got a Semi-Centurion, which is his kind of his auto, uh, his memoir, basically his memoir. You've got his uh, high school masquerade. Mm -hmm. And what was the other well, the, the other one? Was, uh, the Wrestling the Girl. Two. The Wrestling Girl. The Wrestling Girl. And then the one you showed us first was... Um, oh, uh, Historians Proper. The sci Historians Proper, that one, yeah. So all of those, and like I said, Battle Tides is coming soon. Yes. So follow David, check him out. I'm sure we'll have him back at some point to talk because he's a, he's a good friend of mine, and awesome. and uh, and so we'll we'll definitely do it. Check out his videos and what he's doing. I will post this again on YouTube. I just posted Monday's episode. You can actually go to my on the same thing at the top, my Beacons AI link. Go there, go to the third tab. It takes you right to the YouTube channel where you can see Creator Talk Live. There's a, The button actually says Creator Talk Live. Nice. Um, all these episodes, I'll be posting this as soon as I have time to clean it up a little bit. I'll be posting it there. Uh, it'll be up in a couple days. So you can check out this interview if you missed any part of it, all of that stuff. In the meantime, I will be back on Friday. Yep. Did we lose you? Live, pause, the creator will be back soon. Thank you, Brandon. Great interview, have a great night, everyone. Yes, there he is. Kirk Cushman Banzek, I couldn't sure tell if you could hear me. Melissa Cushman Banzek on Friday. She will be the, uh, with us at uh, the same time. 
And I'm probably going to be doing this Monday, Wednesday, Fridays. I think it's easier than trying to book five guests a week. But uh, I'm still working on getting us some musicians and artists. We will have some soon. In the meantime, um, thanks, everybody, for uh, hanging out with us tonight, for all the likes, for the uh, the coins you've given to, to myself and our guest, and for uh, your great questions. David, man, good to see you, buddy. Thanks for hanging out with us for an hour. Can't wait to get a hold of some of your books. It's going to be good. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm looking forward to reading, see what happens with yours. Yep. I'll have to definitely check them out. All right, have a good night. Hey, and thanks for reading uh, How to Write a Novel, too. Of course, <laughs> of course. That's that's the new Bible right there. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate yep, that. Yep. All right, take care, guys. Have a good night. All right. This is Creator Talk Live. <laughs>